All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, you are here for the webinar, Meet EPR Demands Using AI and Robotic Sorting. Before we get started, there's just a few things I want to go over. First, everyone here is on mute, so there's no need to worry about that. Second, this is going to be recorded, so we will send a link of the recording to you tomorrow. Um, third, we're going to have some live Q&A. And so at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Go ahead and click on that and put your questions in there, and we will get those answered at the end of the webinar. And lastly, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. We have McKenna Phillips, Marketing Manager here at Everest Labs, and Catherine Nellis, Solutions Engineer. And so with that quick introduction, I will go ahead and pass this over to McKenna. Great, thanks, Sam. So I'm gonna start with doing an overview of extended producer res responsibility and talk about some of the requirements CPG brands and the recycling industry are gonna face under this new legislation. Next slide. So what is extended producer responsibility? I'm gonna be referring to it as EPR. In most parts of the country, Local governments and residents are currently bearing the financial and operational responsibility for recycling, and EPR changes this by assigning producers responsibility for the management of their products and packaging throughout its entire life cycle, including disposal. So this means that producers will now be held financially and operationally responsible for the recovery and recycling of their packaging. And the whole idea is to incentivize producers to develop and use sustainable and recyclable packaging while financing a more efficient recycling system. If carried out correctly, EPR should drive sustainable packaging innovations, improve access to recycling in our communities, reduce waste generation, increase recycling rates, and overall strengthen the circular economy. Uh, next slide. So what is the current state of EPR around the world? There are well-established pieces of EPR legislation for packaging in many regions of the world, including Japan, South Korea, India, Australia, New Zealand, the European Union, and Canada. So I just wanted to give a few interesting data points that highlight some of the successes EPR has had around the world. Um, first off, there is a 40% increase in the recycling rate uh, for packaging in Germany. This was an increase from 37.7% to 76.2% once they implemented their EPR for packaging legislation. So a huge jump in recycling rates. And then after only three years, the Netherlands saw a 36% increase in recycling rates for uh, specifically plastics. So it's obvious that EPR has been successful in many areas around the world. But what about the U.S.? What's the state of EPR in the U.S.? Um, right now, five states have passed EPR for packaging. Uh, these include California, Colorado, Maine, Oregon, and then most recently in Minnesota. Two states are going through needs assessments currently, and that's Illinois and Maryland. And then just in 2024, there have been 10 states that have introduced legislation on EPR for packaging. Next slide. So we talked about what is EPR, what's the current state of EPR, but why exactly do we need EPR? Um, it's a well-known fact that the world is facing a waste crisis. And a lot of this waste comes from single-use products and packaging. In fact, 71% of waste consists of products and packaging uh, with approximately 55 million tons of packaging and printed paper ending up in landfills annually. So without redesign and innovation in recycling and in packaging, it is estimated that 30% uh, of just plastic packaging will continue to end up as waste. And then in addition, besides these statistics, we know that recycling rates across the country have been stagnant over the past few years. And um, in order to support our circular economy, we really need to increase these recycling rates and EPR is needed to change this. EPR can help us recover this huge amount of material that we lose every year to either our landfills or our environment. Next slide. 
So I listed out some of our potential outcomes of EPR. There are definitely more. These are just the few I've chosen to highlight. And the thing about EPR is that it supports both of our in both the environment and the economy. So a study done by the Recycling Partnership found that when utilizing EPR systems, states can generate over 200,000 jobs while bolstering the supply chain for recycled products and providing billions in economic gains. And all of this happens while cutting waste, preserving our natural resources, and also reducing greenhouse gas emissions related to um, the production and disposal of our packaging waste. So on top of all of that, um, it's going to reduce our public spending on waste management while also increasing access to recycling in our communities. And all of this will definitely help increase our recycling rates. Next slide. So how is EPR going to affect two of the main stakeholders, the recycling industry and CPG brands? Let's start with the recycling industry. Um, under EPR, the recycling industry is going to have to meet higher material recovery targets. As an example, California's EPR legislation requires a continual increase in recovery of plastics starting at 30%. Uh, by 2028, and that will go up to 65% by 2032. And then recycling facilities specifically are going to have to meet increased requirements for, for specific targets as well. And one of these targets is they're going to have to meet uh, material material specific recovery rates of their own. Uh, in addition, they're going to have to drastically decrease the contamination in their outgoing bales of material to meet these new contamination standards set by EPR. And to make sure that the recycling facilities are meeting these targets, they will have to conduct more material audits to collect data on their recycling streams. And then lastly, under EPR, states are adopting what's known as minimum recyclables lists, and this is also um, could be called covered material lists in some areas. So this is a statewide established list of materials that are considered recyclable, and basically this just means that they will be collected through curbside recycling systems, and they also have to be successfully uh, recycled mechanically at a MRF. So as we know, that there's a lot of consumer confusion over what is recyclable and what is not. And one of the main reasons this is happening is because um, what is recyclable changes from municipality to municipality. And the goal of these standardized lists is to reduce that cons consumer confusion and that therefore it would increase our recycling rates. Next slide. So what about brands? To start off, brands will be accountable for meeting certain recycling targets, such as recycled material content requirements for packaging, and this can also be known as post-consumer resin requirements. I'll be calling it PCR requirements. And all this means is that brands will have to incorporate a certain percentage of recyclable material in their packaging. So for example, um, in the creation of a water bottle, brands might have to use 10% of recycled PET to um, create that water bottle. PCR requirements are either addressed specifically in legislation, like in California or Minnesota, who are outrightly establishing minimum uh, PCR rates. As you can see on the right side of the screen, Minnesota requires that 10% of packaging use um, recycled material by 2033. So they could either put it in legislation like that, or it could be addressed under eco-modulation. So what is eco-modulation? As I talked about earlier, under EPR brands have to pay for the disposal of their packaging. And basically eco-modulation is just a fee structure that helps calculate how much they're actually gonna have to pay. So it charges brands fees based on things such as product weight or units, material and waste management costs, as well as uh, environmental impacts of materials. So in really simple terms, producers of packaged goods will have to pay higher fees if they use materials that are considered less environmentally friendly in their packaging. And then on the other hand, packaging that is made out of renewably sourced materials is recyclable, made with recycled content, considered refillable, reusable, 
returnable or has any other reduced environmental impact will typically carry lower fees and brands will have to pay less. So it's essentially an, an, a financial incentive for brands to use more sustainable packaging. So as a result of all of this, brands are going to have to face a large amount of data collection that will result in them having to be very transparent in the life cycle of their packaging. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Katie. Thanks, McKenna. So what role does AI play in that circularity of packaging? First and foremost is visibility. AI solutions like an Everest Labs Recycle OS vision system can be deployed throughout a MRF to identify and capture all sorts of data and analytics on what material is coming in, what is being recovered, and what is being sent to landfill. Some data examples are material characterization, audits, bail quality, landfill costs, etc. Really, it provides insights that are actionable and will result in increased profits and efficiencies across the board. As for those minimum recyclable lists that McKenna talked about, our AI is designed to adapt to new material and packaging types by training within days um, to weeks of observing those new object types. This allows our solution to evolve with the improved packaging designs and changing accepted material lists that will come um, under EPR legislation. And for brand commitments, AI solutions can capture analytics on specific brands packaging in the recycling stream um, and deliver insights on the actual recovery rate to inform you know, how they um, meet EPR laws. Next slide. Let's start with material composition. It's imperative for MRFs to digitize their recycling stream and measure it accurately. To accomplish this, our AI model can identify over 50 classes of objects with 95 plus percent accuracy, which covers all major recyclables. Because we identify objects based on distinct features and not solely the material type, we're able to avoid missorting that other MRF machinery struggle with, like crushed containers or bottles with shrink wrap covering and even some black plastics. And because of how our AI base model is built, we can quickly train it on new object types, like I mentioned. So as EPR develops, MRFs, MRFs will need to be able to sort and process new types of packaging. So the adaptability of our models um, allows MRFs to keep up with advancements in those packaging um, and in those required uh, recyclable lists that are going to be driven by EPR. Our data can also provide mass estimation for certain object classes that will augment audit and bail data. And landfill loss analysis is critical as EPR laws will increase the standards for certain recovery rates. Um, for example, an AI solution on a MRF's residue line will identify all recyclable materials being sent to landfill and uncover associated costs they're facing from tipping fees and hauling. Um, incorporating our robotics is also another way to capture those uh, required materials, which will help decrease contamination in bales and overall increase recovery rates. Pair that with AI on the infeed of a MRF as well, and you can monitor the entire plant's performance. You can compare the incoming and outgoing material in real time, um, identify parts of the MRF process that need upgrading or even specific equipment that needs tuning, and measure your recovery rates across all your material types. Next slide. Um, bail audits, the ability to accurately report on this is important for both MRFs and recyclers. Um, the measurement and tracking of bailed materials, as well as contamination levels in those bales, is key to EPR legislation and actually informing MRFs to improve how they collect and how they sort a particular material type or even in a particular region. 
let's face the reality, most bail audits are done manually today. Um, that manual sampling is time consuming and can be inaccurate, whereas using AI is automatic, it's real time and continuous, providing a cost effective audit. So putting our AI on your residue or on your bail line provides visibility to all stakeholders um, in the process, including the recyclers, the suppliers, um, and even nonprofit or government agencies. Like we have clients that send a monthly report of their recycle OS data to their county to prove their recovery and their residual rates. Next slide. Okay, so what does AI do for brands? Um, understanding the recyclability of your packaging and ensuring that it's being recovered at a MRF will be crucial for meeting um, both corporate sustainability goals and any EPR requirements you may face. Um, so using our AI and robotic solutions, we can identify and recover brand specific packaging um, while providing your company with the data about you know, how recyclable and how effectively recovered those packaging types are. Our Recycle OS platform provides um, reports on sustainability metrics like greenhouse gas and energy savings. And this data can also support um, any corporate sustainability initiatives, um, as well as act as data for audits um, that are being driven by EPR. Um, and with AI, brands can collect both local and regional data to assess how recyclable and how recoverable um, their packaging is uh, by the package type and by the brand that gives them visibility into the life cycle of their packaging, which will be important moving forward. So both packaging manufacturers and CPG brands can use this data to optimize how they design their packaging um, to ensure that their company's packaging is being recovered. And this can position um, those companies to make changes that will benefit them in that eco-modulation landscape that McKenna described. And lastly, recovery. Um, you can use Everest Labs AI and robotics to actually recover brand specific packaging from being sent to landfill. So our small footprint robot can improve the recovery of a recyclable object within existing sorting facilities without huge retrofits or new builds. And with consistent picks that meet and often exceed manual sorters, our robots can be installed easily on conveyors to augment a MRF's current sorting process and deliver higher recovery rates that are gonna, that are gonna be um, needed in the future. Next slide. Um, as McKenna mentioned, the advancement of these EPR laws across major states in the U.S. is only going to drive up demand for that recycled content. So some CPG companies will even be required to, to use a higher percentage of recycled content in their packaging. And Everest Labs is positioned to improve that supply of recycled material for reusable packaging with our AI and our robotics by boosting um, the capture of those recyclable objects, which will ultimately create that stable end market for those materials. And what is everybody's goal with EPR? Strengthen that circular economy. Um, so that's it for me, and I'm gonna pass it back over to Sam for some Q&A. Great. Thanks, ladies. Uh, that was really good. And um, so now we are going to uh, open it up for Q&A. So like I said at the start, you can go ahead and put any questions in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that came in. So this first one, Katie, I'm going to send this your way. Um, Someone said, you mentioned that you do brand identification and can help us understand if our packaging is getting recycled, but we want to know how we can actually access that information. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, so we host all of our data that's captured by our vision systems 
in our cloud and we make it available to you via these awesome dashboards that's, um, you know, it's on a browser based site that we called Recycle OS. Uh, we have standard dashboards based on, you know, the solution that we implement. So depending on the line and the use case and what data sets you're interested in, uh, but they're configurable. So we can customize them based on your company's needs, your requests, and we can also build special reports for you as well if you need them for specific things like audits or to meet your like local and regional kind of uh you know, requirements and, and stuff related to EPR as well. Okay, thanks, Katie. Um, this next question uh, is also for you, Katie. Our, our brand uses mixed material packaging that's often getting assorted. Can your AI and robotics detect and recover those out of MRF streams? Yes, uh, definitely. Mixed, mixed materials packaging have kind of historically, I think, been tough for... Uh, most MRFs to recover properly. Uh, we've actually worked with packaging manufacturers whose, whose mixed packaging was ending up in both fiber lines and also container lines. Um, so we, we can use the distinct features of that packaging type um, and specifics of the branding or the labeling that is there to identify them in the material stream and then use that to instruct our robots to actually recover them out of the stream, whether that's on those existing lines or in a place like a, a last chance or a residue line where, um, where you know, they wouldn't often be recovered. Okay. Thanks. Um, someone is asking, um, is anyone from Everest going to be at the Canadian Stewardship Conference in Toronto next week? Um, the answer to that is yes. Um, one of my colleagues, his name is Brian, he'll be there. Um, so if you want, you can reach out to uh, McKenna here at McKenna at EverestLabs.ai um, and she can get you in touch with, um, with Brian. Um, so the let's see here. Another question is, can the system separate PVC from the rest of the packaging? Katie, is that something that you can answer? Um, I would probably need to ask some follow-up questions on that one so we can follow follow up with them offline. But okay. um, yes, if we can we can identify PVC. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm gonna respond to that person here on Zoom uh, with a quick email. Um and let's see here. We have uh, someone asking some very specific questions about brand containers. And so uh, to that gentleman, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you my email and we'll we'll take that conversation. I think we need to dig a little bit deeper into what you're looking for. So um, it'd probably be better just to have our own chat around that. Um, let's see here. We have one other question. Um, as a CPG brand, uh, this is something we're working towards in terms of EPR, uh, but we're wondering how we can partner with your company to help us achieve sustainability or EPR goals. And so that's a really good question. Um, so I can go ahead and take that one. If you go ahead and send an email to either McKenna um, or Katie, again, those are on the screen here, indicating you want to learn more about um partnering with us to reach your sustainability or your EPR goals, we'll get you in touch with our head of product um, to go over how that can happen. Um, and then we have another person here. She's asking, what types of materials can your AI sorting robot robots sort? I'll let Katie answer that. We can do that pretty high level. Yeah. Um, so thanks for that question. We uh, we identify over 50 different object classes, and, and that's just the start of it. Um, but that covers all the major uh, recyclable materials. So um, metals, plastics, one through seven, um, the different uh, variations within those plastics based on, you know, colored versus natural versus green versus blue, um, all sorts of different characterizations, as we call them, uh, that can be pretty generic, um, and, and then also get very specific down to sizing and color, um, as well as branding. And then in addition to that, I'll also add that um, in terms of 
areas where we're doing QC, we also do what we call like positive and negative. Um, so we can uh, identify the material, the recyclable material that's on the belt, as well as all the not recyclable material on the belt. So trash, uh, scraps of uh, plastic or film and, and other things as well that you would want to clean out of your material stream. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. Um, so we have time for just a few more questions if you guys want to throw any in there. All right, um, so I think we're good. Um, so we will be sending a um, we will be sending a recording of this webinar to everyone that has registered, and you can also just forward that recording to any colleagues you think might be interested. Um, and let's see. Oh, we do have let's see one last question here. Some questions that are are trickling in. This is great. Um, so you mentioned the ability to sort black plastics. Can you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah, so this is a pretty standard um, thing for 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 an AI and a vision uh, product to identify. Um, the reason why I brought it up is because uh, in traditional MRFs, uh, they leverage a lot of optical sorters, which are are great for processing a lot of material. But some of the traditional optical sorters can miss sort on black plastics like PP5, those those food trays that we all know and love if we're if we're into takeout food. So um, because we are not um, hindered by the fact that the black plastic uh, matches the belts below it, we use the characteristics of the object that we're able to see. Um, and because of that, we're, we don't uh, we don't miss that. And and PP5 identification and, and recovery with our robotics is something that we're very, very successful at. Thank you very much. Um, and this last question, we'll hand it over to McKenna. Um, so what are some of the insights that brands are most interested in learning and how can they action that into their packaging? Yeah, great. So from an EPR perspective, um, what's going to be really important for these brands is that their packaging is going to be able to be recyclable in a MRF. So from what I know is um, getting data on whether their packaging is actually being um, recovered and put back into the circular economy, which we can definitely help with. Um, and then also what's going to be great is um, to complete their sustainable packaging requirements, having access to a lot of recycled material content that they can use to uh, make sure their their packaging is sustainable and they can meet their goals. Awesome. Thanks, McKenna. Um, okay, so I think that's it. Uh, we wrap this up at exactly 30 minutes, which is awesome. Um, like I said, this recording will be going out to everyone tomorrow. And thanks again to everyone who attended. And thank you, Katie and um, McKenna, for putting all this content together.